sisters at, at Genesis. Uh, we do ask all of you, whether you're a first-time visitor or a long-time member, if you will sign the registration pad that you find at the end of your road, we might have a record of your attendance with us on this day. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, let me call to your attention a few announcements. Uh, we remind you of the fall adult discipleship offerings that are going strong. My particular class is meeting today from 4.30 to 5.30. Uh, because we're going to have another service tonight at 6 o'clock as we celebrate what we've done today with our Churches Left the Building project. Uh, then we'll go back to our regular time the next Sunday. I uh, want to remind you about uh, our uh, project tomorrow night. Uh, Scott Wilkinson, our uh, children's minister, is uh, doing some work tomorrow night. We're having a uh, a function in the fellowship hall. You see a notation about that. Senior adults are gathering on uh, Thursday, November 17th. Make note of that. Uh, and uh, there are other projects going on you see listed here. Are there other announcements that need to be made this morning? If not, it is good to see you in God's house. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we join together in the call to worship that you find printed in your bulletins. God in his great love has given his son to be our savior. Let us pray the opening prayer together as you find it printed in your bulletins. God of grace and glory, you gave your only Son to be our Savior, that we might come to your way of love and life. Grant that we may have concern for others, and may seek to share the good news of salvation with them. May we not be content with receiving this gift ourselves alone, but challenge us as witnesses of your Spirit, 
that we might help others to find your truth for themselves. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Remain standing, if you will, as we join together in our opening hymn, number 61, Come Thou Almighty King. standing, if you will, as we join together in our affirmation of faith, number 889 in the back of your hymnals, number 889. It is an affirmation from 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 5 and 6, the first chapter, 15th verse, and the third chapter, 16th verse. There is one God, and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, was manifest in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. As God's people gather together in God's house, let us turn and exchange signs of his love and peace with one another. You doing okay? Okay, good. Very good.
You may be seated. This time we prepare our hearts and minds to go to the Lord in a spirit of prayer. We begin our preparation time by sharing our joys and our concerns. And I would lift up to you this morning that uh, I would ask that you be in prayer for the family of uh, Jill High. Some of you may not know, but Jill passed away yesterday evening. Um, and arrangements are incomplete as of this time. As soon as we know something, we will be sending information out from the church office. But do be in prayer for Mr. Hack and, and the rest of the family as they go through this time. Are there others that we would lift up this morning? Let's Margaret, let's remember Margaret Wheaton, who uh, is in the hospital at, uh, at Greenville. Are there others? Yes, Brother Charles. Pardon me, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Let's remember Fred and the loss of Jane Reed this week, uh, Tuesday. It's been a pretty heavy week for the good folks of First Church, so be in prayer for Fred as he goes through that time of loss. Others? Are there any unspoken requests that you would indicate with the lifting of the hand? God sees your hand. He knows your requests. Let's go now to the Lord in a spirit of prayer. We'll pray silently at first, then I'll pray a pastoral prayer. And we'll conclude our prayer time by praying together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Let us pray. Before we pray, I would ask also that, uh, I forgot to announce this, you remember Susan Gerard in your prayers. Um, I think she has uh, been admitted to the hospital this morning, so we want to be in prayer for Al and Susan as well. Let us, let's pray. Merciful God, how wonderful is your law, how gracious are your ways. In your words are sweetness, and in your path is life. Coming as children of your own choosing, we offer our praise to your holy name, and we lift our thanksgivings to your glory. Your promises are true. You've promised us a new way of living wherein your covenant is written on our hearts. But our hearts turn away from you. We fall in love with the concerns of the world. We turn inward to our own desires and then we complain when you do not respond as quickly as we might wish. We abandon you when we give up on prayer and then wonder why we've lost heart. We're selfish and we do not wish to learn. Lord, forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more. Turn us back to you, the source of our life. Your life-giving spirit has been breathed into the sacred writings that instruct us for salvation through faith. Take away the itching in our ear and ground us in your word that we might proclaim the truth to an unbelieving world, bringing it back to the truth. You employ many means to bring health and well-being to your people. Although your ways are not always our ways, we trust that you will make your people whole. This day there are many who are discouraged and who have lost heart in their suffering. Wrap them in your loving arms and give them comfort. If their affliction is not removed, grant them strength to endure. Give to all in distress, all in grief this day, the gift of your peace. Write your words in our hearts and answer what we ask. For we are bold to pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray to you by saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we'll ask our ushers to come forward and ask you to give as unto the Lord. Gracious God, for your goodness to us, we are indeed grateful. Most especially, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we have life, abundant and eternal. Lord, we ask now that you bless us and our gifts and use both for the upbuilding of your kingdom, not only in our community, Lord, but even unto the ends of the earth. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Remain standing, if you will, as we join together in another hymn, number 163 in your hymnals. Ask ye what great thing I know.
You may be seated. Our text for this Lord's Day comes to us from the first chapter, excuse me, from the first letter of Paul to the Christians at Corinth, 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. We're looking at verses 16 through 19 and then verses 22 and 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 through 19, and then verses 22 and 23. I invite you now to give ear to the reading of the Word of God. For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my preaching I may make the gospel free of charge, not making full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. Going now to verse 22. To the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Beloved, the word of God for the people of God and the house of God. Thanks be to God. It's good to see you this morning. It is good to be seen. We're going to get there, I promise. Loyal Jones, the namesake and founder of the Loyal Jones Appalachian Center at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky, shares a delightful story about a minister up in the mountains who on one Saturday evening found himself coming down with something. He got sick and he needed a substitute, so he called on a retired preacher to fill in for him. The retired preacher agreed to do so, though he was a little bit hesitant because this man was such a good preacher. On Sunday morning, the retired minister slowly climbed into the pulpit and he told the congregation, he said, folks, I want you to understand I feel fully inadequate standing here in front of you this morning because you have such a good preacher. When he speaks, it's like he is a clear pane of glass through which the light shines through. I, on the other hand, am like a piece of cardboard that you would use to fill in the pane in the window. Well, he went ahead and preached anyway, and he did a really good job. After the service was over, he was standing in the back and shaking hands and one ardent dear sister came up to him and wrung his hand and said, Oh, preacher, I want you to know, you're no piece of cardboard, you're a real pain. <laughs> so let me ask you this morning, are you a real pain? Have you ever had a real pain in your life? Somebody that was a real pain. Have you ever been a real pain to somebody? Now understand, I'm asking these questions in the context that we've been discussing over the last several Sundays about our call to abundant, generous living as disciples of Jesus here at First Church. And this morning we're looking at the aspect of witnessing. Now dictionary.com defines the act of witnessing as to testify to or to afford or provide evidence of something. As followers of Jesus, it is our responsibility to testify to, to afford, to give evidence of the miraculous, saving, transforming power of God 
in Jesus Christ. I have no doubt in my mind that many of us sit in this beautiful sanctuary this morning because someone was a pain to us. Someone allowed the light of God's love, mercy, and abundant grace to shine through themselves into our darkened lives. That's why we're here today. I know that's true in my case, and I thank God for those people. Maybe you've had an opportunity to be a pain to somebody yourself. A few years ago, I was looking back at a video of a former church, and they were doing a stewardship campaign. And they'd ask a, a fellow who was a good friend of mine while I was in the congregation, share a story about how your faith has been strengthened through the life of the church. And he began to talk about the time that we spent together and how much it had made a difference in his life. And it really it caught me by surprise. I didn't realize what I was doing. I thought I was just having a good time. But I thank God that he allowed me to be a real pain to Woody Gentry. The truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, you and I need to understand the importance of our witnessing the truth of the gospel. And it's needed today more than ever before. Now more than ever, we need people who are willing to be those bold witnesses, to be real pains for the sake of the gospel. The Apostle Paul has some very powerful words to share with us about that this morning, and I think we need to consider them as we consider what it means for us to take up that joyful but serious responsibility of being witnesses, of being real pains more specifically, through the service of witness. Witnessing is at the very heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Without a doubt, this is something that the Apostle Paul took very seriously in his own life. And you think about Paul's experience. Uh, at one point in Paul's life, he was a denier and a persecutor of the gospel. And yet, one day he had a, an encounter, a dramatic encounter with the master on the Damascus Road. And that was a life-changing moment for Paul. It turned Paul from being a Christian killer to being the foremost apostle, evangelist, and witness for the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul took this task very seriously. And you think about this. When, when others wanted to deny the spread of the gospel to the Gentiles, who was it? It was the Apostle Paul who stood forward and said, I'll take it to them. And he went and proclaimed the gospel to the Gentiles. Think about what Paul endured in the proclamation of the gospel. Ridicule, rejection, beating, stonings, imprisonment. And eventual martyrdom. He did all of that to proclaim the gospel. And you wonder, why would anybody do that? And you find the answer in the text I just read. What did he say? He said, I do it all for the sake of the gospel. That says volumes to us who want to be the abundant, generous followers of Jesus that Paul was. That tells us something about what it means to be a real pain. And you know when I say pain, I'm talking about P-A-N-E, right? Now sometimes you may have to be a P-A-I-N to be a P-A-N-E, but we won't get into that. What is it about being a real pain that you and I need to understand? Well, one thing we've got to understand is real pains are authentic. They're authentic. One of the challenges you and I have today in our living out the task of witnessing, one challenge that you and I have in being the pains we've been called to be is the perception of hypocrisy. Dave Kinnaman in his book, Unchristian, shared some really interesting information from a study done by the Barna Research Group. This group studied a group of non-Christians and, and talked with them and 84% of this group of non-Christians said that they knew personally at least one Christian. That's good. 
However, this same group said only 15%, only 15% of them said that the life of the Christian was any different than anybody else's. You see, people are really quick to pick up on the fact that there is a disparity between the message and the lifestyle of the messenger. Real pains don't confuse the importance of the messenger with the importance of the message. What fueled the Apostle Paul's work was not the fact that he was out there speaking high and holy terms in order to earn favor from God and get a little cred for himself while leading a different lifestyle. That's not what fueled what Paul did. What fueled Paul was the fact that he had had an authentic saving experience with God and Jesus and he couldn't help but share it with other people. Paul didn't have the success he had because of his charm and winning personality. As a matter of fact, there's some folks who thought he had neither. What fueled his success was the fact he knew this in his life and he had to share it with the people around him. Authenticity. Pastor Wayne Cordero tells a great story about a time when he and his wife received a $100 gift certificate from somebody in the church for a fancy restaurant in town. One night they decided they'd get dressed up. They went out to the restaurant had a great table, beautiful view, had a wonderful meal. And when the meal was over, Wayne looked at his wife and said, Honey, go ahead and hand me the gift certificate. She said, I don't have it. I thought you had it. Wayne said, I thought you had it. You're supposed to have it during the life. He went on to write, I was thinking to myself, we're in deep yogurt here. Here we are. We've acted rich. We've dressed rich. But without that gift certificate, none of this is valid. It's been invalidated. And there are times in our faith walk when we may act holy and talk holy, but with, I, we're missing that, that segment of relationship with the Master. Relationship validates experience. It grants validity, authenticity to what we're saying. Paul had that experience. He was able to have an authentic witness because it was his story. I want you to think about those pains in your life. What is it about their authenticity that opened the gospel to you? And how is God calling you this morning to be authentic in your witness to other people? Real witnesses are authentic. Real pains are authentic. Real pains are also determined. They are. Did you hear what the Apostle Paul said? He said, a necessity, an obligation is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. I have been entrusted with a commission. This is somebody that's going to get the job done. And if it meant that it put him with odds with somebody else to preach the gospel, didn't matter. If it meant they were going to consider him to be unintelligent, unstable, unsophisticated, didn't matter. He was going to proclaim the gospel anyway. He was going to preach the good news, reach out to people regardless of what it took. He was determined. This is an area where sometimes we struggle in our own practice of witnessing. We may lack a little bit of that determination as we reach out. We may reach out timidly a little bit, but we, we sometimes will lose the determination. If somebody shuts it down on us, no, I don't hear you, we shut down. Gotta get a little more determination. I want to do an exercise with you. I bet you didn't think you was going to come to church and have to do an exercise. Well, you're going to have to do one. I'm going to say some phrases. 
And after I say each phrase, I want you to say the word, whatever. Can you do that? Let's practice that. Whatever. Okay, here we go. You ready? Jesus said, love your neighbor. Whatever. Jesus said there's more joy over one lost soul was retrieved than 99 that stay in the fold. Whatever. Jesus said, when you've done it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. Whatever. Very good. Now, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Instead of saying whatever, we're going to say whatever it takes. Let's try this. Jesus said, love your neighbor, whatever it takes. Jesus said there's more joy in heaven over one lost soul retrieved than 99 that stay in the fold. Whatever it takes. Jesus said, when you've done it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. Whatever it takes. Makes a difference, doesn't it? What we've got to do is to try to find some way to move from whatever to whatever it takes. George Hunter, in his book, Church for the Unchurched, tells a great story about a guy named Bill. Bill wanted to revitalize the, the men's ministry in his church. And he knew that there were a group of young men that liked to go down and watch Monday night football at a local sports bar. And he went down there and got to know some of those guys, and there was an acquaintance of his that had long hair and had an earring, rode a motorcycle. And Bill asked him, said, would you be willing to come to church and watch football on Monday night with us? The guy said, yeah, I think that'd be interesting. So Bill went back to the church and told the men his good news. We got these people who come, and, and we, all we got to do is just watch football with them. The men looked at Bill and said, we like dominoes more than football. You tell them to come and play our game. Well, this young man, this acquaintance of Bill's came back with him for a, a meeting one night anyway. And while he enjoyed Bill's company and he was intrigued by the gospel, he really felt out of place, as you can imagine. And so he told Bill, basically, he didn't think he'd be back anymore. And as he was headed to the door, suddenly Bill just blurted out, Hey, listen, listen, stop. If I get my ear pierced, will you come back? The guy turned around and looked at him and a smile came across his face and he said, You know what? If you care that much about me to do something like that, yeah, I'll come back and I'll bring some more people with me when I come. Now that may be a little bit of an extreme example, but do you get the point? I want you to think about the real pains that you've known. What were they willing to do to draw you in? And what are we willing to do to draw people in to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to the fellowship of the church? What are we willing to do to move from whatever to whatever it takes? So real pains, they're authentic, they're determined. One more thing. They're compassionate. They're compassionate. Being authentic, being determined, very important to being a real pain. But you've got to have the right motive. You've got to have the right source of power, if you will. And real pains do what they do because of compassion, because of their love for the least, the last, and the lost. God's love flows in them, and it flows out of their life into the lives of others around them. Did you hear what Paul said? Paul said he was willing to become all things to all people so that by all means he might win some to the master. That's the call. He was willing to do that because he knew the love of God in Jesus Christ can change your life. And he wanted as many people as could know that to know it. 
And I want you to understand that the power of God in Jesus Christ has the pay, still has the power and the authority to change lives this morning. But we've got to be willing to bear witness to it to other people. Michelle Tyler, in a March 25th, 2014 article in the Journal of the Southwest Baptist Seminary, told the story of a young lady named Putty Salk. She was a, a student at the University of Texas. She was of Canadian, I mean, she was of Cambodian descent, but she was raised here in America. Early in her life, she had been taught some Buddhist principles, but by the time she went to Texas, she had pretty much declared herself to be a, 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 an atheist. But she ran into some Christian folks there and became good friends with them. And they talked with her and shared with her a little bit. By her sophomore year, Putty had said she hit a wall. She began to believe that her life didn't really have any meaning. Everything she did didn't make any difference. And so she was really struggling. And all of a sudden, she thought to herself, if God is real, then he can hear my prayer. And she began to pray. One day she went by the, the, the Christian ministry there on campus and they had a little prayer room set up. And Putty went in to have a word of prayer just by herself. And there was a bowl on the table and it had slips of paper in it. And she, curiously, she looked in there and there were the names of people that the people were praying for. And she noticed that on several of those slips of paper was her name. She had told her friends, don't pray, don't pray for me, don't pray for me. And yet her friends prayed for her anyway, that God's grace would be set loose in her life. And when she said, when she saw those slips of paper with her name on them, she broke down and began to cry. And it's in that instant that God's grace made its way into her heart, and she gave herself up to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as of the writing of the article, she was preparing herself to enter an education phase for full-time ministry. Now, those friends were real friends, weren't they? They were real pains. They were willing to come alongside of her, to share with her, to be a part of her life, and to pray for her. They literally loved her into the kingdom. But if you think about it, isn't that what God has done for all of us in Jesus? He has loved us into his kingdom. Think about the pains, again, in your life that, that helped you come to Jesus. Didn't they love you into the kingdom too? How is God calling you this morning to love somebody? And love means sometimes telling them they're doing wrong and they need to straighten up. How is God calling you to love somebody into the kingdom? I thank God for the pains in my life. And yes, they were P-A-I-N sometimes, but they turned out to be P-A-N-E pains. And God's light shone through them, and I'm here today because of them. I'm so thankful for them. I hope you're thankful for the pains in your life as well. I pray God gives us the opportunity to be those kinds of pains. And we have been given the opportunity, the commissioning, the witness, to, to bear witness to our authenticity, to our determination, to our compassion for the people around us as we witness to the abundant, generous, eternal life that's possible in Jesus Christ. My prayer is that we take advantage of that opportunity while it is ours. My prayer is that all of us are able to be real pains to somebody in the mighty name of Jesus. Thanks be to God for his word to us this day. Amen. Our hymn of going forth this morning is number 463 in our hymnals. Lord, speak to me. I invite you to stand and sing as unto the glory of God. <laughs>
bless you. I love you. I want you to have a wonderful week. Remember all that's going on until we are together again. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Okay.